So this section, we'll look at multiple Poisson regression again. We'll talk about the basics of model estimation. What is the computer algorithm for doing this? And how to handle uncertainty in the resulting estimates. And what you'll see here is very consistent with what we've seen for the other two types of regression and in general for creating confidence intervals and p-values. So it should be a variation on a very common theme we've developed throughout the two terms of the course in terms of confidence interval creation and hypothesis testing. So after viewing this section, you will be able to extend the concept of maximum likelihood estimation to multiple Poisson regression models. Just conceptually extend that. I compute 95% confidence intervals for the intercept in individual slopes, and then exponentiate these results to put them on the incidence rate and incidence rate ratio scales. Understand how to perform a hypothesis test for individual slopes, and also understand the concept of the likelihood ratio test. We saw this in logistic regression as well that allows for the testing of multiple slopes at once. And it's useful for testing whether a relationship between a Poisson outcome and a multi-categorical predictor is significant in potentially in the presence of other predictors or after adjusting for other predictors. So just like with logistic regression, the general approach to estimating the intercept and slopes for Poisson regression is called maximum likelihood. And the estimates for the intercept and the slopes are the value that make our observed data data most likely among all possible choices of estimates for the intercept and slopes. So again, this is a complex computational algorithm that must be done by a computer, but it is one that would be replicated on any software we use, whether we use R, Stata, SAS, SPSS, Minitab, etc. With the same data, we will get the same results. And as we saw with logistic regression, the maximum likelihood algorithm also gives standard error estimates for the intercept and the slopes. And the standard errors allow for the computation of 95% confidence intervals and p-values for these slopes and intercepts. And then the results can be exp exponentiated to get 95% confidence intervals on the incidence rate and incidence rate ratio scale. And just like we've seen with everything else, the random sample and behavior of regression slopes is intercepts. Regression slopes and intercepts is approximately normal in large samples. So again, it'll mean starting with our estimate and then subtracting two standard errors to get a 95% confidence interval. So let's look at 95, how to get 95% confidence intervals and p-values for the intercept from a multiple Poisson regression model as well as for single slopes. It's business as usual, 95% confidence for the intercept. And just to caution you about intercepts and regression models in general, we've seen the result is not always scientifically useful or interpretable, but in the examples we looked at thus far uh, for Poisson regression, the predictor sets have only included categorical and binary predictors. So we'll see in the next section, uh, we'll remind ourselves that in that case, the intercept is actually a scientifically relevant quantity relevant to the sample at hand. But nevertheless, regardless of whether it's relevant or not, we can always compute a confidence interval, but we'd only likely do this in the situations where it is relevant to our data. We take the intercept plus or minus two estimated standard errors. The 95% confidence interval for any slope that we would be looking at in the Poisson regression model as, uh, for our coefficients or slopes beta i, where i runs from 1 to p, where p is the number of x's, we take the slope estimate plus or minus two estimated standard errors. And again, the estimated standard error comes from the computer. The endpoints for both sets of 95% confidence intervals above are then exponentiated to get the results on the incidence rate scale for the intercept, exponentiated, and the incidence rate ratio scale uh, for the slopes, exponentiated. If we wanted to test whether there's association between the outcome, uh, the time to event outcome, and any single x in our model, uh, the p-value for testing the null, that there's no association between the outcome in that x after adjusting for the other models, other x's in the model, know is that the slope for that particular x is equal to zero versus the alternative that the true slope is not equal to zero. So again, we assume, like we always do for all hypothesis tests, we assume the null to be true, that the true slope is zero, and we calculate the distance of our slope estimate beta hat i from zero, but we standardize it by how variable we expect such estimates uh, from studies of the same size to be around their assumed truth. Uh, so we divide by the standard error. So we measure the standardized distance of our estimate from what we'd assume the truth to be under the null zero, and then figure out whether it's far or not from that uh, 
relative to other results we could have gotten just by chance by translating this into a p-value. And the p-value tells us the chances of getting a result as far or farther than ours if the null hypothesis is true. So let's, here's our regression results again, and we had shown them in the first section, and I presented the confidence intervals and such, so let's just show how we got some of these. Uh, the computer actually gave them to us, but let's look at the logic behind it. So let's look at the results on the, on the log scale of the multiple regression uh, for relating relapse from a Poisson, via Poisson model to the predictors of treatment that the person was randomized to, their age, uh, what quartile they were in, where the re re reference is the first age quartile, their racial identity coded as white or non-white, and whether they used heroin and or cocaine. And the reference group for those types of heroin or cocaine use comparisons is, the, is neither neither drug. That's the reference. So the standard error, we'll just look at several of these. The standard error for the slope of treatment was 0.09, and the standard error for the slope of racial identity, which was noted as X5 in this model, and the slope was 0.27. The standard error is 0.11. So let's just look at getting confidence intervals for each of those respective slopes and then translating them into confidence intervals for the, their respective adjusted incidence rate ratios. For the 95% confidence interval for the slope B1, we take the estimate B1 had of 0.22, plus or minus 2 times the standard error estimate of 0.09, get a slope on the log scale of 0.04 to 0.4. And notice that that does not include the null value for slopes or log ratios of 0. So when we exponentiate it, we know the result will not include the null value for ratios of 1. If we exponentiate this, we get an estimated adjusted incidence rate ratio of 1.24 with a 95% confidence interval of 1.04 to 1.49. So this is a little wide and it's hard to perhaps make a strong scientific conclusion because on the lower end, there's a 4% increase in relapses adjusted for other characteristics for those who got the short term versus long term, which is an increase but certainly not large and maybe worth the trade-off if it's easier to give more short-term than long-term slots uh, from a budgeting perspective. But on the upper end, it's certainly more troublesome. Again, it's almost a 50% increase, and that would indicate that perhaps it wouldn't be worth using uh, short-term treatment in lieu of long-term if the relapses were so much more likely. If we look at the confidence interval for racial identity, the slope for racial identity, we get a result that goes uh, from, we take the estimate of 0.27 on the slope scale, plus or minus two estimated standard errors. We get a confidence interval on the uh, slope scale of 0.05 to 0.49. It's just a coincidence that the results here for these two are, are similar in magnitude and standard error. Uh, but notice that that confidence interval for the slope, the log of the adjusted incidence rate ratio does not include the null value for slopes of zero. When we exponentiate these endpoints, we get a confidence interval that goes from 1.05 to 1.63. So again, a statistically significant result, result with a lot of potential variability in the actual adjusted association between relapse and race at the population level. So let's just look at an example of getting a p-value uh, for one of the slopes. We could apply this to any of the slopes in our model. What I'm going to do is look at the slope for uh, treatment, uh, the, which estimates the log of the adjusted incidence rate ratio of relapse for those in short-term treatment to long-term. And so a log of a ratio, the null value is zero. And the slope, it's a slope of a line. So if there was no association uh, between the outcome and this particular x adjusting for the others, that slope would be zero. And so uh, whether you think of it as log ratio or the slope of a line, zero is the null value in either case, uh, versus the alternative that it's not zero. And that, of course, corresponds to a null that the exponentiated version is 1, that the true adjusted incidence rate ratio is 1 versus that it's not. We, Like any other hypothesis test we've done, we assume the null is true and calculate the distance to the slope estimate, beta 1 hat from 0 and units of standard error. I'm going to call this distance. I, I don't like the letters they use in the literature because they sometimes throw people off for linear regression. It's T because we sometimes look up the distance a T distribution to get a P value for a logistic Poisson and Cox. It will we'll call it Z because we're always going to look this up in a normal table, but it's the same measure regardless. It's just the distance measure, a standardized distance measure of our result from that null of zero. Uh, 
we get it something that's 2.44. Standard error is above what is expected under the null. So we know under the null, our estimates of the truth should vary in a normal-esque fashion around the truth. We're assuming the null. We got a result that's up here. And so to get the p-value, we look at the proportion of results that are as far or farther away in either direction. Getting that from the computer, the resulting p-value is 0 0.015. So if there is no association between relapse and treatment after adjusting for sex, age, and type of drug at the population level, then the chances of getting the estimate we got or something even more extreme is 0 0.015. So it's relatively low or unlikely. Some of the other p-values we gave when we presented the results were for the multi-categorical predictors, and we just gave one p-value for the entire predictor set as opposed to each individual comparison being made by the indicators. So as with multiple linear and logistic regressions, in multiple Poisson regression, when a predictor is multi-categorical and hence is modeled with multiple x's, in order to test whether the predictor is statistically significantly associated with the outcome, it's not enough to test each slope individually for the same reasons we discussed in the previous two types of regressions. So in this model that we were looking at, we have two multi-categorical predictors. One is age into four categories, and the other was type of drug used. Uh, the reference was neither heroin or cocaine, and then each of these indicators corresponded to heroin, cocaine, or both. So in this model, in order to formally test whether age was a statistically significant predictor of relapse after accounting for sex, racial identity, and drug type, we need to test the three slopes, sorry, here, here, and here, the three slopes for the age quartiles jointly beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4, the null that they're all equal to 0. Similarly, if we wanted to test whether the type of drug used was a statistically significant predictor of relapse after adjusting for sex, racial identity, and age, we need to test the slopes for all three categorical indicators. There's four categories and three, there's a reference, and then three indicators for the non-reference categories. We need to test these all three together at once. And again, why do we need to do this? Well, it's very possible that we're, mis we're not seeing all associations here. We're seeing beta 6 is the difference between heroin only versus neither heroin or cocaine. Beta 7 is on the log scale, the difference in the log instance rate between cocaine and neither. And beta 8 compares both heroin and cocaine. That's an and sign. I should have just written and. <laughs> and cocaine uh, compared to neither. But what we're not seeing explicitly is a comparison of, say, co um, cocaine only to heroin only, heroin and cocaine to heroin, heroin and cocaine to just cocaine. And those are three other comparisons. Some of those differences may be statistically significant, but we're only testing these three specific ones with individual coefficients here, individual slopes. So in order to test all possible comparisons, we need to test whether jointly together all three are zero. They may be equal to zero on their own, but when taken together, they may not be because some of these other comparisons are combinations of them. And if they're not together jointly zero, it means that at least some one, one combination of these slopes is not zero. So this is a catch-all so that we protect ourselves against missing associations, even if our three or however many indicators we have, even if the primary associations uh, modeled by the slopes of the indicators based on how we've coded that predictor, uh, if none of them are significant, other differences may still be. So the way this works, I'm going to show it for type of drug. We could come back and show it for age as well. This test called a likelihood ratio test uh, compares the amount of information in our Y, uh, the time to event outcome explained by treatment type, age, race, and type of drug, to the amount of information in Y explained by treatment type, age, and race only. So we leave out in our null model, the smaller model, we drop, we drop type of drug. And so the comparison between these two, just to make it more cogent to read, I'll say the null model includes intercept estimate plus 
information or predictors for treatment, sex, and race, and then slopes for those. And the extended model includes all of those things, the treatment, sex, and race portions, but also, also uh, includes the multi-categorical type of drug. And so that's our extended model. And what the likelihood ratio test is, tests whether that null we were talking about before, whether essentially those three slopes are adding more information to our understanding of incidence rate relapse above and beyond treatment, sex, and race. And the idea is, again, we're having to estimate three more associations or slopes directly with the same amount of data. So if it's worth doing so from a statistical perspective, we need to add information about the incidence rate of relapse above and beyond what is already known from treatment, sex, and race. And so this asks, do we add enough information to justify estimating the three more slopes? And the result of this is a single p-value, which we presented in the table that we looked at before. This needs to be done by a computer, and this approach is to generalizable to any two known extended model setups. So you can have a lot more extra things in the extended if you wish to test a bunch of things at once. And the null is that for this test is that all slopes for all additional predictors in the extended model are all zero, versus the alternative that at least some slopes, at least some slopes, at least one slope in the extended model is not zero. So in summary, it's the same old, same old in terms of constructing confidence interval uh, in larger samples. In smaller samples, sometimes you'll get results that are based on exact methods from the computer. Uh, it, does, it won't necessarily tell you this, but the interpretations of the confidence intervals and p-values are exactly the same, regardless of the sample size we have. Confidence intervals for slopes or confidence intervals for adjusted log incidence rate ratios. These results can be exponentiated to get 95% confidence intervals for the adjusted incidence rate ratios. Confidence intervals for the intercepts or confidence intervals for the log incidence rate of the outcome for a specific group, all x is equal to zero. Not always relevant when some of our x's are continuous, but in examples where we have uh, only binary and categorical predictors, the intercept will generally be re relevant to the data we have at hand. And these results can be exponentiated to get 95% confidence interval for the starting or reference incidence rate in the group with all x is equal to zero. Formally testing multi-categorical predictors requires two or more slopes, requires testing two or more slopes, and hence two or more incidence rate ratios together as opposed to individually. Uh, this can be done by what's called a likelihood ratio test. I'm just making you aware of the name of the test, as you'll see it referenced in articles. And I want to make you aware that sometimes only one p-value would be reported for a group of slopes or incidence rate ratios. And the resulting p-value tells whether the MATIC multi-categorical predictor is a statistically significant predictor of the log incidence rate of y equals 1 after accounting for the other predictors in the model.